Welcome to another episode of Mastermind Discussions. I'm your host, Matthew LaCroix. And today, I have another really fantastic guest, a close colleague of mine at Gaia, and a, truly a great friend who I'm very honored to know and have someone that's part of my life. His name is Umar Wise, and he's one of those types of people where you hope you run across him in life because he just truly brightens your day and he brightens the world around him. So uh, I just want to just say that, Umar, it's fantastic to have you here. How are you doing, my friend? Thank you so much. You got me blushing. Uh, you already, if you wanted to get somewhere with me, flattery is definitely the way, and you just did it, uh, and the check's in the mail. I love you, Matt. Thank you for having me on. I'm absolutely flattered to be here, um, and um, I, I kind of knew you thought that stuff about me, but to hear it come out of your mouth so eloquently, it, it truly warms the heart, so thank you, and I'm doing great. How about yourself? How are you? I'm great. Thank you. I, I'm excited to sit down and have this conversation. Um, for those who don't know Umar, and they should, but Umar Wise, is uh, he's an esoteric researcher, spiritual guide, uh, a, a, a mystic. He's truly a, a very interesting person that you don't forget when you meet him. And he's also a father of two, and he is someone who plays a pretty prominent role at Gaia. So Umar, before we get into your story and, and the inspirations that led you on this path, maybe you could just tell a little bit about what you do at Gaia, because you play a very interesting role there. And as always, you know, I interviewed, uh, I interviewed Adam Fitzgerald, and I interviewed Kadrick Olson, and mm -hmm. there's just some really amazing people there, and I want to highlight that. So go ahead and just um, talk a little bit about what you do and some of the amazing things that go along with that. And thank you for the introduction. Big shout out out there again to Adam Fitzgerald and Kadrick Olson, two very distinguished gentlemen and fantastic people. And uh, interesting to boot, you very seldom that you get the full and complete package and people like that. And sometimes I feel like it's unfair that some people can be that talented and then me, uh, not so much. Just, no. kidding, just kidding, just trying, to, just trying to humble myself a bit there. So what, what we do here, what I do here at Gaia, and I tend to think of it as, as my, my purpose. I'm fulfilling a purpose. People, you know, when you go to work, I read this statistic a few weeks ago that said 87% of people hate their job. 87% of people. I don't know where they got those matrices from. I dug a little bit into it. I, I think it might be closer to like 82%, but even that is, is phenomenal to me. So uh, here at Gaia, I'm blessed to be able to connect, you know, connect people. So my, my current role is digital media coordinator. And what that basically entails is we have a lot of hosts, a lot of guests, a lot of people that come on the guy, um, a lot of touching points, let's just say. And so let's just say somebody like you, uh, Amal Lacroy, has a fantastic YouTube following, has been on several of our shows, um, is one of our researchers, one of our in-house and knowledgeable people about, you know, everything Near East, uh, ancient history. It's just it's phenomenal wealth of knowledge. So what I would do is you've been on Gaia several times. I would go and find all the content related to you that you've been in or anything that you might find interesting. And I'd find a way to synthesize it, to get it to you and your audience so it's digestible and hopefully that you like it and get them not only interested in you, but also interested in Gaia. Um, so that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I get to work with some fantastic people, like I said, yourself included. I've worked with Kadrick in the past, um, Greg Braden, Joe Dispenza, um, David Avocado Wolf, uh, Matias De Stefano, some fantastic people that really are, we're moving the needle here. So um, um, I'm kind of like a hand that stirs the cuff. I won't say that my position is huge, um, but I will say that I, I do get to put a lot of information into people's hands. And when I watch it grow and flourish, it's fantastic. So um, that's basically me in a nutshell here, Gaia. <laughs> well, it's, it's a very important role and I really do appreciate what you do, but you also come with such a, um, a high vib vibration love, and just passion for everything you do. And it really shines in, in just spending time with you. So I just want to say that I really appreciate you and what you do um, at Gaia and the world. So, so thank you. Um, and I just, I want to mention, so for those who are wondering where this is going to go, um, Umar and I have had a lot of situations where we were, we've been um, going into like, a, like we're going to have a meeting together. And then some time goes by where we haven't really done the meeting that we had planned because him and I get into such fantastic conversations. Um, he's very, very wise, hence his name. And he has a lot of knowledge and we're going to be talking. We're going to go through a whole plethora, plethora of topics today from the Emerald tablets and Atlantis and Egypt and 
ancient deities connecting around the world and uh, consciousness and ascension and the whole spectrum. So it's going to be a really great conversation. But before we get into some of those other topics, I would love, Umar, if you could just spend a few minutes discussing how you got on this path and what some of the biggest influences for you um, for this understanding and higher consciousness that you have. Wow, that is that's a an excellent question. And, and I actually thank you for it. Um, I think one of the things I do want to say here before we get into that, something you said a moment ago, you said knowledgeable and wise, hence the name. I always make this distinction that, you know, the difference between knowledge and wisdom is wisdom is knowledge applied. That when you find out about something, you know, and you go out and apply it, it's kind of like the scientific method. Does it work? Can I apply it? Is it, is it uh, reproducible? You know, can I do it multiple times? Can I show it to somebody else? And then they could do it as well. Um, and so that's kind of uh, where this all starts. The way that I got into this path, down this path, is, is very varied. But um, let's just say I had a lot of influence from my family. My father, he was Muslim. Um, he did two tours in Nam, and that influenced him heavily in his, his spiritual beliefs. And my mother was raised Catholic, um, but she was very, very let's just say into the psychic realm. Uh, my, my mom was a self-proclaimed, I, let's not call it medium, let's just, uh, she said she would get senses about things. She would, she would call it her sixth sense. She would just like, she would feel vibrations. Uh, my grandmother and great-grandmother on the same side would talk about the same thing. But I think the thing that really, really kicked me down this path, there's two things. Uh, when I was seven years old, I was walking home from school and I got struck by a car. Um, so I was in a coma for about two weeks. And when I came out of a coma, um, I was bedridden for about three to six months. And during this time, um, I remember having very vivid dreams about, you know, my myself, um, where I was going, what I was doing. Um, it, was, it was very interesting. Another thing that happened at this time is that my mother decided since I wouldn't be able to go to school that it was time for her to take my education into her own hands, and she purchased me the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so um, for those of you, those of your young audience out there that don't, don't know what that is, I think nowadays they call it Wikipedia. Um, I'm just I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The Encyclopedia Britannica is pretty much is a um, let's just call it the repository before we had a YouTube, before we had a, a Wikipedia, it was the repository or the culmination of human knowledge about pretty much every subject, you know, A to Z. Um, and so, you know, starting, I think it was in April, my mom's like, here, read this. Here's a thesaurus. Here's a dictionary. Anything that you don't know, I'll help you out with, but you should be able to work your way through it with this. And as I'm going through this thing and and now thinking back on it, it's so hilarious because it really did, it stoked my flame for curiosity. And I think that's one thing that we're really, I don't want to say missing in the world, but it is dwindling, is, is a, a, a huge hunger for curiosity. It's just wanting to know, no needing to know almost. Um, and, and that's what that really stoked in me. I'm going through the encyclopedia and I'm finding out things that are blowing my mind, you know, you're in A, you're in aviation, aeronautics and things like that. You, you know, you get the B and you, you're talking about, you know, botany and so, so on and so forth. And we're getting through. And as I'm getting through this, uh, I'm, I'm realizing that we only know a small, small, small amount about, about the world, about the universe, about how we interact with it. And that we're kind of grasping at straws, that we're kind of guessing. And the more you know, um, I think of knowledge as being a, a bubble, right? Your knowledge can fill a bubble. But then think of the universe outside of that. Everything within your bubble is what you know. Everything outside of that bubble is everything you don't know. Um, so the bigger your bubble gets, the more you expand. Yes, you gather more knowledge, but you realize, oh, there's so much more for me to know. Um, I think I once heard, um, I'm for I'll forget who said it, but the, the quote goes, we now know that there are three things for sure, that there are known knowns, things that we know that we know, there are known unknowns, things that we know that we don't know. And then there are unknown unknowns, things that we don't know that we don't know. And for me, the latter of the three is the scariest thing, but also the most interesting thing. So um, fast forward from seven years old and the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, I go to a couple of things in life. Um, my, my life, uh, some people would call it hard knock. Um, I don't know. I think it really helped me become the person that I am. But I ended up actually in foster care. And I saw some things in foster care with other people's families, with, with people themselves. And I started getting really interested in the human psyche and, and how does the human psyche play on our consciousness and, and how does you know, our surroundings impact us and how do we impact our surroundings, which helped me formulate one of my favorite mantras that I am not 
and or I'm not an object of my environment or I'm not a product of my environment, but my environment is a product of me. That outside forces do not dictate my internal condition, that I choose whatever my internal condition is. And so um, going through that experience in foster care, which for some people, like I've spoken to a lot of people who've gone through the same experience that I have and haven't turned out, um, let's just say as well, um, and I'm not just saying that to toot my own horn. There's there's a lot of trauma in the world today. And you could turn on a television and see it everywhere. You can go on your Instagram, your Facebook. And there's a lot of good stuff out there. Get me correct. Uh, at the same time, there's there's a lot of things going on in the world that need to be balanced out. So um, going through my teenage years, I saw a lot of things with different people, different families. And I started thinking about, you know, um, you know, how does the human psyche play on things and so on and so forth. This is when somebody actually got me the book, The Kabbalion, because I was talking to him about mentality. And they're like, oh, that sounds like the law of mentalism. I was like, the law of mentalism? What, what is that? And so this friend got me the book, The Kabbalion, and I ate it up. Absolutely ate it up. And now, so this takes me, this is going to dovetail. My father being Muslim, he was very, very much into um, routine. He's very much into, you know, where did religion come from? Religion of the science. He thought, he thought all religions were sciences. And so he sent my older brother to Egypt for a year and a half to train um, at a, a, a Muslim mosque there in Egypt. And there's a lot of things that when my brother came back, he was telling me about Egypt that didn't match up to what I saw in my history books and so on and so forth. And so when I started really, really looking, I started finding out more and more on my own. And I started realizing that our education system, our history, especially history class, does a terrible job at facilitating that, that knowledge, that subject. Um, so I did a lot of research myself. But what I came to find out is that a lot of the laws from the Kamalion started to match up with some of the things I was seeing in the Egyptian Book of the Dead and some of the things I was seeing in like the Emerald Tablets. And I was like, why, where, are these, where are these things coming from? And so back at people nowadays, you know, having YouTube, having Facebook and, you know, instant gratification when it comes to um, sharing knowledge and information, you and I grew up during the age where, you know, sometimes it took a, a while and, you know, granted, we didn't have to send postcards and stuff to each other. And we did live during the, the uh, internet age, but dial up was a thing and it was hard to find stuff on the internet. And so when I was finding these things out, I was 17, 18 years old, it's 2001, 2002. I had nobody to talk to them or talk to about these things. It was, it was ridiculous. That's why I love having conversations like this now. So, um, I started looking and doing all this research myself. And you know, as a researcher, and a lot of you watching this know as a researcher, when you get, uh, my grandmother used to say, a bone in your teeth, and you can't get it out, you just can't pick it out because you keep digging, you keep pulling back, go down the rabbit hole, so to speak. And that's part of not, you know, knowing that there's knowledge that you'll never ascertain, knowing that there's an infinite amount of knowledge and you'll only get to know a pinprick of it. So, that's what I started to realize. I started dovetailing these things together. This Kabbalion book that came to me because I was only interested in how people's mentalism or how people's minds played a role on their psyche and how they viewed the world. And then how it connected to this other thing of research that I was doing about Egypt because I felt like I never got a fair shake at it in history class. Um, so that was my teenage years. Then I went to college and college was fantastic. Now, um, I don't know how your audience feels about, um, uh, uh, what do you want to call them, plant-based substances, plant-based medicines, um, but I had never touched or come in, or I came into contact with some before college, but I was a very a studious student, a very studious student. Like I took school, and at the time women, but school way ser like very seriously. So I'd never touched this stuff, but in, in college, um, some women, my thing about women, um, tricked me into in doing some plant-based medicine. I say trick, but I, looking back on it, I should really, you know, write them a note and thank them. Um, because that, that introduced me to a different level of thinking where I had these, I didn't even know I had these different paradigms, these different walls built up about how I viewed the world. And this is how I was saying, how your mentality will shape how you view the world, the, the lens by which you view it there were things that melted away and I started seeing things from a different scope. And I, and I realized there are some things that no matter what way you look at them, no matter how many different ways you look at them, the understanding will boil down to a few things. And those few things sometimes could just be, you know, chance, um, you know, uh, which 
we'll talk about chance later. I think, you know, in, in the whole universe, there's no such thing really as chance. If you know the mathematics behind it, it's just that we don't know the mathematics behind it. And then, you know, the energy that you put into things. And when I started looking at things from that angle, I realized some of the things that were happening in my life, maybe because I'm putting too much energy into the bad things. And that came back to the law of mentalism and things like that. So um, anyways, these walls are breaking down. I, I'm, and this is only on, on marijuana, which like people talk about it being a gateway drug. Um, I think what really happens is with um, some people, they have gotten themselves into a place mentally, spiritually, or emotionally that they're looking for some form of escape. Um, and, and marijuana is an easy way to get into it. It's very, it's very light. It's very kind to you as far as um, plant-based medicines go. Um, but then after a while, since it is very light and airy, it doesn't really do what it used to do for you after a certain amount of time, especially if you abuse it to the point where you're trying to, like I said, escape something. So um, yeah, I have my views and opinions about uh, gateway drugs or whatever you want to call them. But I will say that it did introduce me to other plant-based medicines. Now, I've never been interested in pharmaceutical um, drugs, which is ironic because I did go to school for pre-medicine. That's what my bachelor's degree is in. Um, but uh, I, I find that there's something uh let's just say refreshing about connecting back to nature in that way the fact that there are plants out there that mother nature will produce for you to help you bring yourself back to who you really are you know that like the old adage on the temple of uh delphi know thyself i think there's there's things out there that that help you know thyself a little bit better so uh, that was my college years i spent a lot of time um just really reflecting on myself that's when i got into meditation that's when i got into yoga um that's when i got into really really sitting down and reading these old old, old books like uh, uh, we were talking about a moment ago so whether we're talking about the, the egyptian book of the dead or we're talking about the um uh, the epic of gilgamesh which you know i heard as a child little bits of it but then going back as an adult uh with my level of knowledge that i was getting into at that time and then um the world exploded for me um my last year of college when somebody introduced me to the Zachariah Sitchin books. Now I know there's a lot of um, information or not information, um, uh, feelings around that, but I read through those books and, and it led me to another set of books uh, or readings or writings called the West Penra Papers, which that then again blew my mind because at this time I'm synthesizing this idea that we came from a higher level of, of consciousness. And this isn't just me. This is all the stuff that I've been being introduced to, the, the meditation, the uh, going to yoga retreats, the hanging around people that have been introduced to this beforehand. So I went from in high school, not having anybody to talk to, to in college, now having maybe two dozen people to talk to about it. But they were very varied. I knew some Wiccas, um, which was interesting. Uh, I knew some um, self, uh, self-proclaimed uh, Sufis, which they weren't really Sufis, but um, I'm not gonna say, anything about that. They were interesting people. They were trying to become Sufis. And um, there were some um, people that said they were warlocks and wizards. And, and I didn't understand this until I started asking them about, about their practices and what they were doing and how some of these, they talk about these ancient rites come from ancient Egypt and they were passed down through lineage and went through stuff like the, uh, uh, the Scottish Rite or the Freemasons. And I, you know, I started getting really interested. So anyways, um, now I'm making these connections, you know, um, as above, so below, so as, you know, as below, so above, as within, so without, as without, so within. I'm starting to make these connections. I'm seeing that everything is connected. And then um, probably about around my late 20s, um, one of my friends came to me and said, hey, um, have you heard of this network called Gaia? And I was like, Gaia, like, what are you talking about? And he's like, dude, I watched this documentary on them the other day, uh, something that you and I were talking about. I think it was, um, I want to say Eric Von Donneken. Um, and he was talking about, he was talking about uh, the, how the gods were still here. And my friend and I had had a conversation about how um, in some parts of the world, you'll have a God that does this very, very specific thing, like has this very specific moniker and power. But then over here, 5,000 miles away and maybe 100 years apart, there's this very, very similar God that has a very similar name, that has very similar powers. And I'm like, you know, there's, we're, so anyways, we're having this conversation. And then I see this documentary by Eric Von Donneken and I'm like, my goodness, this is exactly what I was talking about. Yet this guy has been researching it for 50, 60 years. And so now I'm hooked because for me, the, the curiosity is I can learn more from a person that has been doing it for their entire lifetime than me going out there and trying to put the thing together. You know, I can go now instead of me wading through all the, you know, little pieces of dirt to see if I find a golden nugget, I can go to the person that's already, you know, minted gold bullions, ask them how they did it, and then I can go figure it out for myself. 
So that's where I was when I first got introduced to Gaia. Um, it was ironic because I was living out here in Colorado where Gaia is located, had no idea that they were located here, had no idea that they even existed until my friend had introduced me to them. Um, but after I started watching their content, I started realizing that some of the, well, a lot of their content I had come across like just in my own research, like on YouTube or just clips on the internet, but they had the whole thing. And I was just, you know, I'm sitting there with popcorn, you know, how some people would binge watch Netflix. I was binge watching, like, uh, like I said, Eric Von Donnegan. I was binge watching Juvalo Malkizadek. I was binge watching um, you know, Graham Hancock. Like I just couldn't stop watching this stuff. You know, some like one thing that I want to talk about just for a moment, just a small aside. For anybody that doesn't find this subject interesting, just for a moment, if you know anybody that's a builder or a mason or has laid tile in their own home or trying to do any type of housework, the Great Pyramid on the Egyptian Steppe is about 480 feet tall, all right? And this thing is massive, like it's absolutely massive. The space that it takes up, I think it's like three or 13 acres of uh, hectares of space that it takes up is absolutely massive. Graham Camcox talks about this a lot. I know that you could probably talk about it uh, better than I can, but the one marvel about the Great Pyramid that astonishes me every time I hear it is that at the base, the very center of the base of the Great, Great Pyramid and the very center of the peak, the very top, are less than a quarter of an inch off, according to Google Images, less than a quarter of an inch off. That is almost impossible. And no reason I say almost impossible because there it is in real life in Egypt, right there. We can't recreate it. I mean, it, there's skyscrapers that are off by 20 feet by the time it gets to the top and maybe not that much of a variant because it might fall over, but a quarter of an inch is absolutely fantastic. And, and you know, we tell people in history class that it was slaves that built this with, with no, with no uh, wheels or no, no pulleys or you know, it just, it blows my mind. So um, this was my, my late thirties. I get introduced to Gaia and now I'm hooked. I'm eating this stuff up. Um, and there's something about knowledge, especially when you start, I, I think about when you're, especially true knowledge, it's something that resonates with true knowledge that, that, and when it hits you, when you hear it, you know it to be truth. It's the same thing with a lie, like you can hear the vibration of frequency. Um, I think psychopathic people are a little bit different. They can, they can convince themselves that a lie is the truth and then their vibration can come off that way. And that's something different we can talk about. Um, but in my personal opinion, when you hear truth, it just resonates with you, you can feel sense it. Um, and so I'm, tell, I'm getting this truth. And when you start waking up, you start seeing, I like to refer to, I used to say it a lot, that I found out that I was on fire, that I put myself off, I stopped, dropped and rolled as, oh my goodness, I can't believe I didn't realize I was on fire. And I look around and I see a lot of other people on fire. They don't have the correct information. They don't realize that they're on fire. But then once you give them that information, like, hey, you don't have to walk around with no knowledge about what's going on in the world or what's, you know, how we got here, who we are as a species, who we, who you are, like your individual power. Like I see people that feel powerless a lot. People tell me about their powerlessness, you know, about things that are going on in the world or things that they feel are happening to them. And they just need knowledge about that power. And, you know, Gaia's content has a lot of knowledge about that power. Um, so anyways, my late thirties, early thirties, I'm really getting into the content, but where I'm working, where I am in life, the people that I'm talking to, the people I'm sharing this knowledge with, um, they're just not having it. I think it was maybe Aristotle or Socrates that said, don't cast pearls at the uh, feet of swine um, because, you know, you know, they don't, they're not going to recognize the wisdom. And so I, you get this sensation that you're hitting a wall, you're hitting a wall, you're hitting a wall. And my wife, one day when I came home from work, she's like, oh, you know that Gaia network you've been watching out? They had a couple jobs posted, so I sent them to your email. I applied for like six positions here in Gaia. Um, and so um, I ended up not getting any of them. I actually got a mug the first time, which was fantastic, even though I only drink tea, no coffee. So, um, and then um, I applied two more times, ended up getting a position here. It was an entry level position, but I told myself I would do what I could to get in here because I felt that I, I could help Gaia in some way, shape, or form. I didn't know how what it was. I didn't think my uh, bachelor's degree in pre-medicine would be it. You know, I didn't think they were looking for an on-campus physician, which when I found when I got here, I actually found out we do have an on-campus physician, which is hilarious. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's really how I, I got here. Um, Great. I know that was kind of long-winded, but thank you for letting me speak. And that that's uh, 365 or 360 at least, how I got here. That's a, that's a great story. And I love hearing about how people end up down this path. It's, it seems like it's these 
events that that happen at different points in our life that then obviously that ends up focusing us on these different paths than others right it's yeah. that image of uh, the the herd of society going one way and then some some you know some kid or some teenager or young adult that is like looking this other way and like is curious about that other path right and they're kind of wandering down it a little bit and they're wondering why no one's really going down that path they're like Hey, where is everyone? Right. And it's, it's funny, but it's, it's also really serious at the same time, because like you said, you can't just walk up to someone who's, if you're walking down the street and someone walks by, like walking their dog or something, and you just walk up to them and you start talking about the ancient Egypt and Atlantis and like talking about cuneiform tablets and ancient stories that are completely different than what we're taught in school they're literally going to run the other way in most cases now you may get lucky where you run into that random person who's on the same wavelength as you or at least is open-minded and i appreciate when those happen but like you when i was going down this road I was just trying to have like a loudspeaker and like scream to the world, right? Why, why aren't you paying attention? And I was ended up realizing that I was wasting a lot of my energy because people that I would in, really focus my uh, a higher conscious mindset, which takes a lot of energy when you're trying to explain to someone all this stuff and they look at you like you're like you have three eyes, right? Okay. Um, but not in a good way. <laughs> I hope so. And you, okay. you, realize, <laughs> you realize you're like, like, what am I doing? I, yeah. I, I could focus on people that are at least open-minded or people that have curiosities in these areas. And then you interject this, these little bits of knowledge that, um, and to me, one of the most humbling things that one can ever do in life is provide someone <coughs> a little, this little nugget, this little spark in their life that and maybe it doesn't happen right away, but it, it tra ends up transforming their entire mindset in their life from that point on. You know, because of some little thing that happens, they then start looking into themselves. And then five years down the road, they remember, maybe remember back on that moment that that diverted their path in a different way. So I really do appreciate so many of uh, the people listening to this and you and others that that try to go around and make such a positive change and in, in, in keep this idea that we are incredible beings that are seeking this higher knowledge, this wisdom that exists all around the ancient world that really isn't talked about in school, this doctrine of boring history that we're taught in this very simplistic manner where you're falling asleep in class and you're like, you graduate and you're like, boy, I guess I don't have anything left to learn, but really it's not, it's not like that at all. You, you've been mainly conditioned in a lot of ways to go down a very different path of, of a mindset that it really is, um, it's, um, it's not including most of what really, really we should be learning about and we should know. So on that note, Umar, I would love to jump into some of these topics that you're very well versed in. And, and since you already discussed it a little bit, let's talk about, um, let's talk about Egypt. Now, in its original name, we know that Egypt was called Chem or Kemet. That was the original um, name for the first grand civilization of Egypt. And interestingly, that's where alchemy, chemistry comes from, because the ancient Egyptians, like if you're looking at the Great Pyramid of Giza, like you mentioned, it's built, it's built on a massive bedrock um, surface that has subterranean areas that go down below it. But there's the, the key is always there's, there's an an aquifer water system that seems to relate to this idea of the different elements that go into what makes water and electricity harmonize into like, like cymatics and, and vibrational frequency and, and raising consciousness and, and creating all these different aspects that really go into the fundamentals of what alchemy is. And so talk a little bit about the ancient land of Kemet and talk about some of the influences, perhaps places like Atlantis and some of how the teachings from Egypt with like Thoth have influenced your understanding a little bit? Well, before we get started, I want to say big shout out to you and Billy Carson. Uh, the two of you have done so much in this field that, I mean, I know that we're going to get onto the subject, but I just want to say what the two of you have done is nothing shy of incredible. The two Thank of you, you have done so much work and we're going to get into it, but I, I just, I have to say that because we did not get a fair shake at, in history class. I mean, there's some history that they do a fantastic job of going over. 
uh I'm, I'm not recollecting it right now because like, like recent history right like the last exactly like you know, years or something right exactly but when you look at some of the ancient marvels and not just in ancient egypt uh, but if you look at places like uh Globeke tepe or you look at some of the um the uh, uh, native american serpent mounds or even you know uh, chishnu chilon um some of these places around the world absolutely fantastic but when we're talking about egypt it's almost like um the architect wanted to put their signature on something there and so when you're talking about toast and you're talking about the emerald tablets and this this is when i was talking earlier about dovetailing i started peeling back and what i realized is that history hits a wall like you said whether it's uh 500 years a thousand years whatever you want to call it two thousand years to the birth of christ or even three thousand years to the uh um or six thousand years rather to what the muslims say is uh, when the world was created any of that, it hits a wall where um, even if you're talking about from the fossil records, people say that uh, we were hunter gatherers until that point, we lived in fields and savannas, and then all of a sudden we have uh, agriculture out of nowhere. And so there's this distortion there. And so when you start peeling back, and like I say, Gaia had all of this information and I'm looking into it and I'm reading into it. And one of my favorite books, and I still read this uh, two or three times a year, is the Emerald Tablets of Toth. Uh, and I do love seeing uh, Orthos or the Atlantean or Hermes Trismegistus or uh, Hermes, just there's many names. But what I would like to say is the information there is so vast. And he says, or he, it, the deity, whatever, uh, however you want to refer to it, is that to read it over and over again, and this is the same thing with whatever you read, but I find it exceptionally true with this piece of content, is that whenever you read something, you have that level of knowledge and that scope of knowledge that you have at that moment, and then you go through other things in life, and then you read it again, and you have a new purview, you have a new uh, scope, you have a new uh, lens that you view things through. And what I've noticed about that book is that it always wants to make me more find out more about myself and how I interact with the universe around me you know so whether he's talking about how the sound and the vibrations we put off influence things around us and how we, we are a magnet for what we want and, you know a lot of these laws of uh, the Kabbalion or the hermeticism come into play from what Toth was saying in the emerald tablets but if you go back even further if we're talking about if we're talking about Atlantis and and this is one of my favorite subjects because there are so many varied ideas about Atlantis, yet there are so many stories for different cultures, kind of what we were saying about the gods earlier. There's so many different stories from different cultures about this advanced civilization. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm not full hearted with Graham Hancock on this. I definitely think that there, uh, that there are other influences from off world that have come to this planet. I, I firm heartedly believe there's been extraterrestrial influence on this planet. That being said, I also believe that we do, us as human beings, come from a very high level of consciousness. I feel that there have been, uh, let's just call it constraints put in place to make us uh, less, more docile, easier to manage. You know, um, It's kind of like the same thing like uh, as, as like spaying or neutering your dog. And, and I don't want it to sound like that uh, um, vulgar or anything like that. But I feel like there has been constraints put around our, our, our mentalism, our spirituality, our ability to ascertain things that were commonplace in the past. And so um, that all being said, in the Emerald Tablets, Toth does refer to himself as Toth the Atlantean. And when, when you read about it and his knowledge of what was going on in Atlantis, um, about how he had his um, flames for curiosity stoked by someone he calls the dweller of Indol or the, the dweller, um, how he goes through this journey of just wanting how he interacts with the universe. I started thinking to myself, if there's this being that claims that he'll live from aeon to aeon forever going on and on, that there are other beings around him like that, that you can do whatever you want, but you choose to learn everything, you know, choose to be um, a lifelong research then what would I be doing as a human being than not to do the same thing? You know, uh, I just, for, for me, it was just, it was, it was commonplace. And you could see this, you know, you same thing if you're a religious sort, same thing with the Buddha, uh, same thing uh, with Jesus Christ or Yahshua Ben-Hur. Um, a, a lot of these ancient deities, a lot of these ancient figures were lifelong researchers that they knew that their thirst for dollars would, you know, never be quenched or satiated. Yet at the same time, they knew they were doing a service by, by seeking this knowledge. Um, so anyways, uh, 
as Toth goes through this amazing journey and he brings you with him to Atlantis and then from Atlantis to Egypt and you start seeing these connections. And so um, I can't say, um, I'm not as uh, well-versed as the research as you, well, I would, uh, that, that I will say, I'm not gonna denigrate myself, but I'm definitely not gonna hold myself in the same light as somebody like you or Billy Carson. What I would say is though, there's so many things in that story in the Emerald Tablets that line up with a lot of the other research that I've done, especially with a lot of the information from the Near East, um, the Atra Jesus tablets and the Sidera, and you know, we talked about the Epic of Gilgamesh a little bit ago. Um, there's so many things that, that he hits with pinpoint precision, yet at the same time, from a level of knowledge that you're like, this has to be a firsthand account. So anyways, um, I, I'm going through every year. Like, I, In fact, I, I started it three weeks ago. I think I'm gonna finish it. I'm gonna listen to it on Audible too, because there's one I like to listen to. And then I have Billy Carson's version. I loved uh, his little annotations because with anything like that, to have somebody else's viewpoint and opinion, like I said, seeing it from a different lens or a purview, I love, absolutely love that. That's why I think the research that you have done on this is, so any, anyway, so uh, Toss the Atlantean talking about living on, on Atlantis and how there was this, uh, I'm, I'm summarizing here, um, but how there was basically this interdimensional rift that was caused um, and that, that pretty much there needed to be a sacrifice that was made and the sacrifice was the island and his teacher to an extent um, to, to seal this rift, to seal this hole that was created, whatever this cataclysm was. Um, and in doing so, Toth, or Toth, or Toth was tasked with taking the knowledge, taking his wisdom, everything that was learned, the repository of Atlantis and what had been done on this planet um, and starting it somewhere else. And he talks about how Earth net field force was damaged and he needed to stabilize it quickly and how he formulated the the architecture for the great pyramid in his mind and it was done hastily and so when when you make references like that and even though it's uh, it said i know that he's this this being when you read the tablets it's not like this being is coming from a place of ego it's almost it's so matter of fact it's it's, it's it, you could find it dry if you didn't really if it wasn't so riveting um but he says you know i did it hastily because we needed to get earth restabilized like so the fact that such a, a perfect thing that's Still today has survived pyramids, had survived floods, had survived, you know, being in the middle of like one of the harshest environments on the face of our planet. And it's still there today, you know, almost perfectly aligned with magnetic north, you know, aligned to Orion's belt. Like these things that it, were it, even if it was done only 6,000 years ago, the impossibility, we didn't even figure out how to align um, architecture to magnetic north until I think it was 400 years ago, like it commonly, like today. So yeah, it's fantastic. But the fact that he said that it was done hastily to stabilize nets, uh, uh, or Earth's net force, that's what, like what? And then he says he comes to the land of Kim and that it was filled with barbarians and that he had to subdue him with um, a, a display of his uh, magic science to an extent. Um, and that how he raised them from, uh, uh, they were in caves and he raised them to a higher level. And so when people talk about how we went from being hunter gatherers to all of a sudden now we have agriculture and it started right there in the near East, you know, where Toth is talking about where he started. So all these different things but then you really start peeling it back when you look at just egypt for itself or the land of cam the dynasties there every successive dynasty since the fall of egypt can't even it's not even tantamount combine to what egypt did and it just and just just to put in perspective even if egyptians dynasty by all small estimates lasted about six thousand years all right how do you keep a pharaonic dynasty going for 6,000 years. I mean, we live in America and we're falling apart at the seams after 258, 260. And, you know, and, you know, we, even if, like I said, you combine, we're talking about the British Royal Empire, if we're talking about um, the Dutch, the Dutch Empire, if we go back to Ottoman Empire, if we talk about even the reign of some of the dynasties in Great and um, China, it doesn't, it's not tantamount to what was done in Egypt. And at the same time, Egypt was attacked for the better part of 3,000 years, people try to take down Egypt, 3,000 years. I mean, it's it's absolutely phenomenal when you really start looking at the land of Kim and its history and where it comes from and how, and how from outside forces to inside forces, how for thousands of years it stood the test of time and how many, if not almost every major civilization since that has been modeled off of some layer of the pharaonic system from the land of Kim or ancient, or ancient Egypt. So it's 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 mind-boggling because like i said it doesn't get a fair shake 
And even if you would have to almost become an Egyptologist, and even then, I almost feel like, pun intended, there's a hermetic seal put on a level of knowledge there that, that even there's like a hush, hush, shake hand, wink, wink, nudge, nudge type of thing that once we bring you into this brotherhood, this fold, you can't talk about certain things. Um, uh, there's, I don't want to mention any names, but you and I know of a certain conversation that happened um, in Egypt and where a person got very upset and, you know, didn't want to have- Sahih Hawass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to stoke any flames, but <laughs> that, that's what I'm talking about. But Zahid, before Zahid had that conversation many, many moons ago, he was a devout researcher of the Edgar Cayce um, uh, information. He was, he was very, very interested and thought some of the stuff that he said about ancient Egypt, ancient land of Cam, and what, what the uses for the Great Pyramid were, were interesting, and he was researching that, and we would we very much tout Edgar Cayce's information. Then he becomes the, the curator of Egyptian antiquities, or I, I don't know his exact title, hope nobody lambastes me in, in the comments, but from that point on, he, a tone changes. And we see this happen a lot. We've seen this with insiders, uh, people in government, whether they're talking about uh, UFOs or UAPs. We've seen this happen a lot in different fields that you get very, very close to the truth. They induct you in, they say, hey, look, you stop talking about this. You're gonna have access to a lot of other knowledge. You'll get the knowledge, but other people out there can't have this knowledge. But you'll have power if you if you hey. trade your your soul for power, basically, right? Hey. Exactly. And and there's this, and it's like it's like this, it's I don't want to call it a boys club, but there is this club where it's like I, you know, it's kind of like exclusive because I get to know and you don't get to know. And it's almost like they're laughing at us because we're grasping at straws and not people like you. You've done some hard research, some stout research, and but they want to keep it behind this closed door. And there's, and I think the reason for this, and this is just a small aside, there was a research study done a few years ago about what the impact would be so uh, social or, uh, psycholo or psychologically, uh, social economically, if people found out there was off-world influence, not only throughout history, but still currently today from extraterrestrial forces. And when I talk extraterrestrial, I, I wanna specify a couple of things. There are, there's, in my personal opinion, there are people or beings that can span the, the gap of space, you know, maybe from galaxy to galaxy, the vastness between different planets at, you know, uh, subluminal speeds or even, you know, uh, post-luminal speeds, you know, hyperlight speeds. Um, and then there's, when we talk about frequency or oscillation, um, the, the vibration of actual atomic, like atomic particles, um, how things have spins and they also have vibrations, how things can spin in one direction or spin in another direction, have a pole shift and things like that. I think there are beings that can control the oscillation and the frequency of their, of their matter and go in and out of different realities. And I think there's influence of all of that, you know, from beings that can travel the, the, the gaps of space to beings that can shift in and out of different different vibration oscillations. And so um, what would be the impact on religion, let's just say, if you found out tomorrow extraterrestrials pop down and say, yeah, we've been here uh, 6,000 years. Yeah, we knew Jesus. He was from this planet or whatever, so on and so forth. Well, how would people react? You know, um, people like you and I, we'd probably research into it. Um, there'd be a good bit of people that probably could be able to, you know, adjust to it. There might be a huge swath of people though that would riot in the street. Let's, let's be, let's be hundred percent clear. Not everybody. And there's been my personal opinion. I think governments around the world uh, through media, whether it's movies, uh, whether it's through, you know, uh, television programming, whether it's through songs or whatever it might be, have been softening us up for um, what they've been doing over the past couple of years, especially since 2000. Soft disclosure, right? Exactly. Soft disclosure that um, one of my favorite movies, two of my favorite movies, actually, one is Contact. I believe the uh, actress. Great is, movie. I love that movie. It's one of my favorite. And, I, and we were young enough to get it when we were like, you know, maybe young teens or young adults. And they're like, there's not enough uh, extraterrestrial movies where it has a good ending or it's not about bang, bang, shoot them up like independence so or family. spaceships or something. Right. It's about something interdimensional or higher, higher consciousness and exactly. teaching. And, yeah. Yeah. In that movie, uh, Jodie Foster's dad, uh, as a child, gets her a telescope, and he asked, she asked him, does he believe that there's extra or life out there? And he said, he goes, well, if you really think about how big the universe is, if there's just us out there, that's a pretty big waste of space. I love that. Yeah, I love that, that quote. You, yeah. you know, and so you think about that, and you go, wow, you know, you step back. 
if you really think, if you are completely closed-minded to the fact that there might be intelligent life, not just life, I'm not just talking about plants or a mitochondrion or bacteria floating on an asteroid somewhere. I'm talking about like actual intelligent life. If this universe is 13 billion years old, like we estimate, and we're, we've only been here for the better part for you know 1.4 billion years or whatever it might be, uh, human being, or not human beings, but our planet, whatever it might be. Um, are there beings out there that's been out there a lot longer and what have they discovered and like how have they done it so on and so forth but yeah i think the ramifications of that would have huge impacts on people around the world on you know 7.8 billion of us um so there's that and then you know um what would people think if they didn't you know if the government knew about this and they were hiding this from me what else have they been hiding from me or if the government has to admit to this they have to admit to a lot of other stuff that they don't know and then how safe are we really so there's all these different things about like why they have to keep egypt secret why they have to keep ancient kim secret why they have to keep ancient atlantis and ancient lemuria secret or at least close to the chest because the moment that that comes out and is like people are like this is like the people that have tinfoil hats they called us for so many years those people can say i told you I, i've been telling you i've been telling you um yeah, yeah once that's common knowledge you can't put that genie bucket back in the bottle so to speak and so um one of my favorite shows growing up was star trek you know star trek they talk about there's this this point when everybody on the face of the planet goes you know what we need to go all in the same direction that that there's extraterrestrial life out there and they have galvanized like it's not like you don't go to planet vulcan it's like oh the southern vulcans and the eastern vulcans no they're vulcans they're all vulcans and, you know they same thing with the uh with the uh with the ones with the uh, not the vulcans the ones with the the Klingons, the Klingons, same, the Klingons are all together. You don't see Klingons for, and you know, arguing about all oh, these Klingons are from the Middle East or whatever. No, they're all Klingons. That's what we need. Earthlings, we, right? We're exactly. Earthlings, earthlings yeah. you know, one planet. Like, I don't know about the rest of you guys. We're talking, Elon Musk is trying to get to Mars. I don't know if you've seen it here recently, but it's not livable today. We are here right now. All right, let's treat this planet fantastic and let's tell people where we come from. If we, I, there's the old saying, if, if you don't know where you come from, you have no idea where you're going, right? I love that. So yeah, me too. The fact that we don't know that we come from a higher level of consciousness, the fact that we don't know that the pyramid was, or most people don't know that the pyramids weren't built with simple hand tools, you know, that these, these, 350 ton, 40 ton, 10 ton, uh, megalithic size pieces of stone were not cut, quarried 400 miles away and then rolled by slaves day and night for 32 <laughs> yeah. years. Like, come on, let's be realistic here, people. Like, if, like, do the math. Like, could they get anybody today to do that, even with slave labor? No way. And there's 7.8 billion of us on this planet. And so, yeah, so going from ancient, you know, ancient Atlantis to, you know, what Toth was saying in these tablets to him saying that I saw the island of Udal and Atlantis go beneath the waves. And, you know, I wept for my teacher. And then, you know, I went to the land of Kim and I had to stabilize Earth in that force. And then I read other things, you know, I've read, you know, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the uh, the Sutra, not the Sutra, the uh, Atrahasis tablets. Um, my, it's and, my favorite. That's my favorite set of cuneiform tablets of all is the Atrahasis. And so I had to see, but I'm pretty sure that you, you've studied cuneiform. I had to get translations. So like even my, you know, my, my base level as I'm going through this, I'm just like, wait a second, like this matches up almost exactly with what's being said over here, but was written this many years apart in a different part of the world. Yeah. And then we were talking about earlier, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh talks about going on this, on this grand journey to find the Sutra or, you know, the, this person that the only, the person that survived the flood and that we the him. Oh yeah, Ugin Apishtim, yes, that that give, they gave this person infinite life, how, like how like because of what he did for the gods and, and because of Gilgamesh thinking about what is going to come, what's going to be, what's going to come of him. This is like, wait, what? Like, okay, and then, but Gilgamesh is then mentioned in the Bible and then in, in the Torah. And then you're like, well, how can these places over here talk about it and people can take them as the gospel, but then not gonna talk about these other things. Like, why did I not find out about these books until I was in my thirties? And, like, and they're all considered myths so that people, even they come across them, they don't take them literally or think that there's anything real in it, right? Thank you. Thank and they you. hide those, those then they become hidden because they're, oh, we're told they're metaphors or allegories for things that aren't real. But wow. then, like, like I mentioned in a lot of my discussions, and you know, is but we get direct cities that are mentioned that existed in specific places that were ruled by kings for certain amounts of time. And then there's like literal stories that emerge from those of right. like, for instance, the great deluge, just these catastrophes on earth that are then shared by cultures all around the world. So, yeah. you know, what is going on there, Umar? 
So, and then and you make that point, right? Because, you know, whether we're talking about the Native Americans of the Midwest, you know, from, you know, 6,000 years ago, uh, and one of the uh, one of the books you and I kind of touched base about before is uh, a set of papers called the Terra Papers, written by a, a man named Robert Morning's guy, um, and had culminated all of the information of the Native Americans um, pre-European um, influence about how they had what they called the Sky Fathers and the Sky Mothers that had been coming down for thousands of years and were seeding them with information about where they came from and how to work with the land and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, but all these different cultures that within certain like very close time frames are talking about, yes, there was a great flood, something happened that, you know, it displaced a lot of us. Cultures all around the world that are, you know, 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 miles apart, 30, 40, 100 years apart. How do they have the exact same type of information so close with the events being so, so similar? And we don't talk about it. And so, that, and, and that's just history, right? And then when you start peeling that that layer back, you're just like, you know, you know, why lie about this? Because it's power, because it's control, like you said a moment ago, that, you know, once that genie's out of the bottle, like we said, how much will people start questioning and then how much control will governments or even places like Egyptian antiquities have over, you know, the places in these sites, you know? Well, and uh, it's a paradigm. It's a paradigm thing too. Imagine how people view their existence in in the world and one of the things i like to really 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 um just mention as much as i possibly can to bring this open is when, when we look at the universe and we look at everything from the hubble telescope to as far as we can possibly see where light travels from the greatest distances and reaches us we know that there are not not thousands not millions but trillions of star systems trillions and i know that number might fall flat to a lot of people but to try to imagine if you have trillions of star systems which we have now know is is true and we look at the idea well how many planets within those star systems are potentially even habitable using only just that idea of the goldilocks zone based on, on our own perspectives of earth we're yep. still talking about trillions of habitable worlds in fact there are more earth-like planets and star systems than then it's been estimated than every grain of sand on every beach on earth yeah imagine that you go down to the ocean yep. and you 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 get a handful of, right. of 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 thousands and thousands of thousands of grains of 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 sand in your hand and you realize that that's simply one tiny little scoop of the overall aspect of how much exists out there so what i'm trying to say with that is the point of that is knowing that and having that perspective and knowing that, of course, that we wouldn't be the only sentient beings that exist in the sphere that we that work in the, in the solar system. Imagine now a world where the majority of people, the majority of people on our entire planet, you said there's 7.8 billion people. I bet you a good seven of those exist in environments that have extreme light pollution or they don't spend any time outside. And it's very strange to me. Imagine you... You get out of um, you. You work all day, right? You do you do some mundane set of tasks all day long, and yeah. then you drive home with your car, and then yeah. you step out of your car, and before you get in your house, rather than looking up and staring into the vast cosmos, you are just focused and you're a, like a pilot focused on just walking in that house, turning that TV on, sitting down, and doing these tasks. And yet, the vastness of the universe is all around us, and I think that lack, even just that lack of perspective. Right. And, and realizing that we're on a, a sphere that's traveling a thousand miles an hour through the cosmos is phenomenal to think about, isn't it? It's like even if you had that, just that alone, a lot of things around you that make us conformed in our thinking would seem ridiculous. Now, add on what you just said, though, add on the idea that, well, look, our civilization isn't 6000 years old. It's yeah. far older than that. It may be more than 50,000 years old maybe even older than that, yep. but not only that, but we have tangible evidence that multiple versions of civilizations have risen up that in yep. some ways were more sophisticated and had more knowledge than we do now. Hence why the Great Pyramid of Giza is built in such perfection of uh, the ratios of our earth and moon and sun that yep. we couldn't even do today. Now, having imagine though, that all of those things were taught. Imagine you go into school and you sit down and the teacher starts discussing the wonders of the universe 
and all the different aspects about how consciousness is non-localized by the brain and exists in a state that is far beyond just this organic computer that we are, and that we are eternal conscious co-creator beings that are part of this entire story of the universe. Imagine if we were taught the, the real history of, of our story and then the vast, what consciousness is in the universe, you know, what would our world be like? What would our society be like? What would, what would each person be like? And I think that that paradigm that has so many different avenues, whether it's spiritual, metaphysical, or even just literal with in terms of understanding the timeline of ancient history, if yep. the, those things are tightly guarded and protected, because there's a certain narrative and perspective here that is, that is very much um, well-organized and, and guarded to yep. not allow us to have that that paradigm. Now, I, and, this, and this will lead into what I want to ask you is, do you see that changing? And, and is it changing now? And where, where are we going to go if we were to able to incorporate something like that into this idea of a utopian future or like ascension of our consciousness? Oh my goodness. I love that segue. And a moment ago, I wasn't laughing at you, but mo mainly what you said when you were on, you said we we're on a uh, giant spinning or giant streaming planet, or I forget what you said exactly. Sphere, but yeah, yeah. yeah, it's moving. I use in, in college. That's one thing I used to always say to people I go, do you realize that we're spinning at thousands of miles an hour rotating at uh, around the sun that we don't even know how it works and operate. We're a giant spinning crystal like we're like if you yeah. think about the, the, the earth itself, like we are putting off a resonance of the 432 hertz. And I know a lot of your uh, watchers know what that is, but we actually, when you're in a silent room and you hear that, and if you can get away from, you know, uh, Bluetooth and get away from Wi-Fi, go out in the nature, you know, and you hear there's this very high pitch that earth puts off, it's, it's going at a ridiculous pace. And if you ever see true models of the, uh, of our galaxy, or not our galaxy, of our solar system, what you'll see is we're on the tail end, right at the edge of, of and I'm going to answer your question in a moment, but just you said this, yeah, we're yeah. right on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy and we're spinning, spinning super fast. And what they recently found out is that the edge of the Milky Way galaxy actually spins faster than all of the mass closer to the massive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So we're spinning super fast, but then also the sun's just pulling us along. So it's like the sun's pulling us along and we're kind of like spinning, yeah. catching up. It's a phenomenal. People walk home, like you said, get out of the car, go inside, turn on Netflix. They don't even think about it. Like it's crazy. Even, <laughs> it's just even the amount of trouble that we're in, right? The fact that like the, the uh, what is it? The Lord meteor shower. The fact that at any moment, like we have nothing we could do if a, if a massive, you know, let's just call it state size, country size uh, or meteorite, came crashing down. Like, I know we've seen the movies. I know we've seen, um, what are they? And, uh, not Independence Day, uh, I, I'm, uh, uh, Armageddon. In, in and fact, stuff. in Armageddon, yeah, in, don't look yeah, up and yeah. Don't yeah. Look, look, we would be screwed, all right? I don't, don't fool yourself. We do not have the nuclear capability. We do not have the technology to detect that in time. We would be absolutely screwed today right now. If a, if a giant solar flare, like a massive solar flare, there's one that happened um, and I think it was the mid 1800s that took out uh, or late 1800s took out telephone lines from New York all the way to California. If that happened today, we'd be SOL for a long time. So that all being said, um, people don't think about this. I do see it changing. Um, I think that hermetic seal is, is slowly but surely coming off. And I think um, you were rubbing the genie lamp. The genie hasn't quite come out yet, but it, it's starting to. It's starting to be Aladdin, you know, Aladdin's genie, poof, any moment. Um, and the reason that I think that is that the information age, the the just the ubiquity of in the internet being everywhere. The fact that, you know, 10 years ago to get a one gigabyte of space, you would cost you a lot of money, right? And now you can buy an iPhone with 560 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes of space. You don't even blink at it. You fill it up with pictures and your favorite applications. Yeah, you know? but they, empty, empty, silly things, right? You know, but you have more technology in the phone in your pocket than, they, than supposedly they did on, on the moon landing mission, for Christ's sake, like, you know, use it to your advantage. And so, but I think because of, and, you know, Gaia, you know, you've done some amazing work here, Gaia, you've been on several, you've been on Open Mind, you've been on Beyond Belief, I think you're, you've also been on Deep Space, uh, you've been on Ancient Civilization, which still is one of my favorite, if not- Those are favorite. coming, but yes. <laughs> oh, I, Oh, it's, we're teasing. I'm sorry. Hey, look, I, I didn't mean to let the cat off the bag. <laughs> I'm just excited because these are yeah. some of my favorite shows and, and I'm passionate about it. But 
just the fact that this information has a place to live and breathe, um, yes, I do see it changing. Um, and I don't want to get too much into politics or what's going on too much in the world. I want, I want to keep it on subject. I will also say, though, that the past two and a half, three years have been a crucible for a lot of people where there was a lot of self-reflection done. And there was a lot of time allotted to people to ask questions, you know, not just the simple vapid questions when there was no sports going on. You know, they, they talk about ancient Rome. They had circus and food and entertainment to keep the masses. Right. The same thing today, you know, football, basketball, baseball, there's a season, you know, it's always a season, you know, whether, even if you're not into that sport, there's something going on, but uh, the past- Entertainment, right? To keep us focused on different things. Entertained, yes. Keep us entertained instead of, you know, you know, entertained. Because being think. bored is actually kind of a blessing and a good thing when you say- yeah, well, my mom used to say um, idle time is the devil's play thing. That's where I found myself, like I said earlier, finding the most out about myself. You know, people talk about triggers. I don't think people know what really triggers them or they put themselves in situations to be triggered on purpose. Um, but by knowing yourself, you can go, you, you can polarize yourself, you know, some more of the Kabbalion hermetic principles, but you can polarize yourself in a state of neutrality and don't let outside forces dictate your inner condition. Um, so yeah, I see a lot more of that happening. I see a lot more people out there, people that I went to high school with when, like I said, I didn't have anybody to talk to yeah. that remember a conversation that he, he and I, or she and I had, you know, 13, 18 years ago. And they're like, oh, remember when you said that thing about ancient Egypt and history class, and then the history teacher didn't have an answer for it. <laughs> I recently yeah. saw this. My teachers it. hated me. <laughs> oh <Yeah>. my, bro. <laughs> look, I, got, I got kicked out of Sunday school. So my great grandmother was Sicilian. And so my great grandmother, when I was about six years old, she told me, she used to tell me all sorts of crazy stories, but the one that sticks out, she said she was in, um, her, her degree said geologist, but she was actually, um, um, uh, what do you call it, archaeologist. Um, so but she, it was funny because she would tell me like how to tell the difference between a fossil and a rock. She would lick it and like all these different things. Like you, you probably know, you've, you've been out there, you've been out there with the mineralologists and things like that. But she told me the story when I was six years old about how when she lived in Sicily as a child, she went on an excavation tour where they found a femur bone that was six feet long. And I was like, at the time, I kind of, she showed me what a femur was. She's like, you know, she's like, boy, it was six feet. Six feet, do you know what that means? It means whatever had that thing must have been at least, you know, 20, 30 feet tall. She's like, do you know that they're suppressing this? And then she showed me like she had the Smithsonian Institute, uh, um, the used magazine that she had from um, 1980 or the 1880s, where it was showing these giants that this person, that they showed this person standing next to this giant skeleton that they just yeah. encountered in a uh, uh, Native American mound in Ohio um, was like 20 feet tall. And so I got to Sunday school the next Sunday and we're talking about David and Goliath. And I said, okay, what about this giant dude though? Where are they at? Like, yeah, right. They around? And the teacher's like, no, no, no. And like I said, they take the rest of the gospel as the gospel. But when you start asking, okay, Jesus walked on water, David slew Goliath with a stone. Where are these giants at now? What are they doing? Are they hiding? And the Sunday teacher, Sunday school teacher, sent me sent me away quick i got kicked out of sunday school twice <laughs> i did and my, too <laughs> and my mom and i had to go to choir practice i became a great singer though so um anyways so yeah i i see things shifting because there are people like i said and i i i tend not to think of people as closed-minded anymore i think there are uh, another three the, the law of three right um there are three types of people there are people that that see there are people that see when shown and there are people that don't see at all or choose not to see and I think we're getting more of, of the first two than the latter um, these days that, especially like I said, over the past two and a half years, you had so much time to sit and research and ask the questions that maybe you didn't ask before, or there was a lot of conspiracy stuff coming out, stuff that we used to call conspiracy stuff um, that turned out to be fact or true. And you know, like I said, I don't wanna to get too much into the politics of it, but there's a lot that happened in the past year that I was talking about in 2014, 15, a lot of people that I listened to and research were talking about you know, even before that. And then it started happening over the past few years. So I think that has allowed people to really start asking the hard questions, like not just the vapid surface level questions, like, oh, did you see the game? But the question is like, oh, how are you doing personally? And have you thought about 
your place in the universe and how what <laughs> yeah. how what you think and say affects those around you. And like you said, that consciousness isn't just like located here. Like your brain is not your consciousness. You know, this is just this is an experience that you're not a, a human having a spiritual experience. You're a spirit having a human experience. And so I see a lot more of that happen happening. And I think it's like the hundredth monkey effect. Uh, that for the I mean I know, know that you probably know, but there's this uh, saying that once uh, a certain amount of monkeys uh, learn something in a colony that all the monkeys learned it. I think it came from, there was a study done off the coast of Japan like 16, 17 years but ago. But that percentage is actually pretty small in what that shift has to be to, to then impact the rest of it, the rest of the social group. Exactly. So I think that since there's so many people, like I said, that I couldn't have this conversation with even three, four years ago that are now asking me questions and starting to get a, uh, a little bit more interested going down certain paths. Um, and like you said, uh, there's a pathway that we're on that you see the herd and everybody else going this way. And we've been walking and you're like, man, it's really lonely out here. Now it's starting to get a little, I see more people. I you're see, like, hey, I didn't, I didn't you know? see that before, right? There's like <laughs> exactly. I see, I see my friend Matt LaCroix over here and I, you know, I see my friend Adam Fitzgerald and I see my friend Kater Golson. And we're starting to connect and we're starting to interweave our, our communities. People like, oh, Kedrick knows runes like nobody else. He and I have had a conversation about Norse myth mythology that when he first he first found out that I had studied uh, the, um, what, uh, what are they, um, the prose Edda and the Ed's Noah, um, he was just like, wait, what? And I was like, I look, I love, myth. like, I don't think mythology is mythology. I think it becomes myth and it becomes legend, but I definitely think, and so he and I have had kind of like you and I, like hour long conversations about Norse mythology and how Norse mythology connects to a, a lot of the stuff that we saw in the Middle East and especially in ancient Indi or India. The same um, deities and influences basically. Doing the same thing like, oh, I will lightning over here. I will lightning over here. Or I rode on a chariot over here where pulled by goats. I rode on a chariot over here pulled by goats. Like, you know, these different similarities, they're, they're just like too uncanny that these, these cultures are separated by vast amount of distances and sure there was probably some interconnectivity between them a hundred percent at the same time how do you come up with almost the exact same thing in different places at different times uh, in different languages so um yeah I, I i'm very excited my my one hope is though my one hope is and you asked me um how do we picture this utopic topic future and and it's exactly like you said earlier i think it starts with knowledge about where we come from all right so without knowledge about that, we can never be informed about where we're going. That if we don't know where we come from, we can never, you know, look to ascertain our greatest heights. It's and something that's not just an animal, but like a steward and in a highly, highly conscious being in the universe type of aspect. I, when you were saying a moment ago, how, um, and we're, we're extremely, extremely unique. Um, the old adage goes, you are not a drop of water in the ocean. You're the entire ocean in a drop of water. But at the same time, our, our planet, we, this is the only one I know that we can get to right now, all right? So to be a steward of not just, think about us as human beings, but then there's so much life. Well, what have we done to this planet, you know? Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk about climate change. So, and I was so sad. It's, and you know, you look at some of the just amazing creatures, the whales, the dolphins, but even though know, you think about some of the like mosquitoes, we try to kill, kill off mosquitoes, you know? The rainforest, the things that we've done to this planet as an intelligent species, you know, as a spiritual species, are startling, you know, to the only place that I know that we can live, the only place that I think any of us know right now that we can live. So, but only I, because of that antiquated mindset that we've exactly. allowed. So, how do we how do we envision this utopic future? It has to start with ourselves. It starts with our diet. All right. And that, I don't just mean diet by what you eat. I mean, by what you consume, because they have done it good. And when I say they, I mean, the status quo, I mean, maybe the on world or off world entities that are looking to keep us in a low vibration or oscillation. They've done a great job everywhere that you turn that there's going to be some type of low vibratory information. So what you do is you have to change it, you know, whether it's Gaia, whether it's my good friend, Matt here, just listening to his uh, different, um, um, whatever, whether it's a podcast, whether it's an audible, whatever, whatever it is, listening to people like this that stay in high vibrations and getting all of the junk out of your life. So like I said, your diet is not just what you eat or what you drink. It's also what you look at. It's also what you hear. And it's the people that you hang around with. And probably most importantly, it's the thoughts that you think. What are you thinking? How do you think about yourself? So if you're constantly thinking about, you know, war or famine or grief or disease, then those things are going to manifest in your life because yeah. you don't attract opposites. You attract what you are. You put out a vibratory frequency and you attract back to you what you are. 
So I would offer this to not only just, you know, the people listening, but I do, this is also for myself. Think about what it looks like for us to live in harmony with one another. And I know that it can be a little bit challenging, but just vision with me for a moment. People together, wanting to make sure that other people succeed, wanting to make sure that our planet succeeds, wanting to make sure that not only wildlife, but you know, everybody, everybody has is satiated. And we can do this in many different ways, whether it's through technology, whether it's through coming together and sharing ideas. What we have to realize is that most people, if not all people, want a few of the same things. They want to be loved. They want security for themselves and their family. And they want their base level needs taken care of. They want to be able to have you know, good food to eat, clean water to drink, and a place to sleep at night. And so if you can take care of those things, and then, you know, 2022, we can take care of those things. Like what's happening is that um, money is in the way. Uh, money, a lot of people believe money equates to power and power equates to your influence over other people. And we, if we can shift past that mindset, I believe that we are shifting past that mindset. Uh, I think the way to shift past that mindset is to really, I, and I take this from the Bible, um, treat your neighbor as your family, you know, think about, put yourself into the shoes of the person next to you. Like Matt, you and I look very similar, you know, you, you and I, we could be twin brothers, man. I, I think you, I think of you as a brother. Like I look at you and I think to myself, if Matt was in trouble, if there was something going on with Matt, I would do everything in my power to make sure that Matt is. Appreciate doing. that much love, my friend. Yeah. It will, and and then I know that you would do the same for me. Like I, I've I've seen you stick your neck out for people that you barely know around here. So I think it starts with that the shift in mindset. How do you talk to yourself? Um, there was a study that was done that said that you will speak to yourself in your mind more than any other collective group of people put together in your entire lifetime. And so what I would say to that is cultivate a great relationship with yourself. Be your own biggest cheerleader. Yes, definitely be realistic. When you do something and you mess up, hold yourself accountable. At the same time, you can find many people out in reality to beat you up if you really want to. So uh, do yourself a favor and treat yourself well. That if you don't believe in yourself or you don't treat yourself with unconditional love, no one outside of you will. Then, you know, outside of that, the education system, um, we really need to fix our education system and not just here in America, but I'm talking about abroad. Uh, we, we only touched on the education system. Uh, we don't teach math that children need to know or people really are going to use throughout their life. Uh, we don't teach people anything about finance and we put people into a financial trap from the moment that they step out of high school. Um, we don't teach people anything about social skills like they you just kind of throw people in the water and you, you like the first time I left America, I was slapped in the face for culture shock, like how other cultures, like in America, we are really insulated. Like, even if you just go to Canada, it's way different. You know, even if you just go to Mexico, it's way different, but you go to Europe or you go to the Middle East or you go to Africa, you, or if you've never been out of this country, you'll be in for a rude awakening. Uh, and I think we need a, a lot more of that. I think the internet helps us out with that. I mean, you and I are doing a Zoom call right now, but we need more interconnectivity and we definitely need to fix the education system. Um, everything from history to mathematics to science we need we need not only just you know men but we need girls you know young young women to be interested as interested if not more so interested in the math and sciences and i think we need to share more we need to um uh, as countries i think there's this this power struggle between how do we share information and so on and so forth without giving our our enemy um, the upper hand and how do we get get around that you know president reagan said in the 80s he he said how I think that we would galvanize as a planet if we were faced with some existential outside extraterrestrial force. I don't want it to come to that. I don't want early our extraterrestrials to show up at our doorstep like, hey, we're going to blow you to smithereens because you guys can't get along well. That's like your parents coming in and spaking two siblings because they were yelling at each other. Um, at the same time, I do think that we need to galvanize behind something. And that's the one place I do struggle. Like when I when I picture my utopic future, um, when I, not just my, but our utopic future, because I have two daughters now and I think about it a lot. I think about how do we get around all the differences between cultures and then realize at the base core that we're all human beings looking and striving for the same. We're all earthlings, right? We're all from earth. So, so yeah, hopefully some of your watchers, some of your listeners out there will be able to give us some answers, some insights. Um, but yeah, I think with just, it has to start with you. You know, if you can change your inner monologue, your inner mindset, 
Um, and once you start showing yourself unconditional love, you start treating yourself well, and you become your own biggest cheerleader, it becomes way easier to do that for other people in your life. You know, when I see you, your passion that you have about what you do fills me with passion. I'm passionate about other people's passion. And we start ripping off of each other. Isn't it, right? it is infectious. High vibration <laughs> is infectious. It's the good type of viral, you know, yeah. um, but it's the same thing. It goes in the opposite direction in the, in the Kabbalion and laws of Hermeticism. It actually says that a lower vibration will more readily take over a higher vibration than a higher vibration taken over a lower one because it's easier to stay in a lower vibration. So exactly. yeah, that, that's where we are right now. That's the keep your, and when you gave me the compliment when we first started, um, thank you very much, but it's people like you that keep me fired up or, you know, on a high vibration, high oscillation. So well, likewise, my friend. And I just want to say that, you know, and I mentioned this a lot, but I think it's important to add to what you just stated a second ago is a lot of people will see this knowledge. And like you said, applied knowledge becomes wisdom, yeah. but they'll ask, you know, why, why do I want to apply this to become a better person? How is it going to change anything else around me? You know, what is it going to do if I follow this path of higher consciousness and I walk around and I influence a couple people around me? Like, what does that matter in the grand scheme of almost 8 billion people? It really does matter. Remember like what Umar just said, this hundred month monkey effect means that we don't need to have the entire total. We don't need 80, 90% of society becoming esoteric, higher conscious beings walking down the other path. We don't need that. We only need that 10%, right? We need that smaller subset group of people that are then infecting the conscious bubble of reality of all those around us. Because in the end of the day, we are co-creators of reality here. And we're far more than just animals. We're something on a level that is truly a higher vibrational being of the universe. And we have an effect on not only our society and the people around us, but on the entire grid in this in this crystal sphere of the earth that we live on and we're all playing a part the earth is playing a part we're playing a part but we're not separate we're part of the same story it's not like how something is going to happen tomorrow and we disappear and we're never heard from again our story is is always been written about in every ancient ancient text from around the world and and culture that has handed down these messages and these stories is that our path and our story is destined for something amazing, incredible, but it's also interwoven with the earth. And so if we can remember what we are and how, how important we are, we can truly change this entire paradigm and this reality. And it's something that I don't think we can even really truly fathom where we're going and, and how we're going to get there and the means for which this, our transformation is truly going to happen. So I just want to say, I really appreciate everything you do, Umar, because that's part of that great shift that is occurring right now with people like you. So I really appreciate everything you said today. This was a great discussion. Why don't you go ahead if someone and tell people, if someone wants to contact you for any reason, is there some, is there a means for which they can do that? Well, you know what? I feel comfortable giving it out on your channel. Um, if, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, go ahead and look me up on Instagram. It's Umar Wise One. So U M A R W I S E, the number one on Instagram. Uh, Umar Wise, U M A R W I S E, on Facebook. Look for this beautiful mug. I do, do, I try to do uh, weekly or bi weekly Facebook lives. Just, um, I just, I, I like to share. I love sharing. Um, I do actually work at a place called Gaia. If you've never heard of it, uh, you should check it out. We have um, two Instagram channels. One is We Are Gaia. Another one is Yoga on Gaia. Um, I've done several, if not dozens of interviews on there. Um, but yeah, 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 just, or at the very least, at the very least, hit my boy up, Matt. Just reach out to Matt and Matt knows how to get a hold of me. Um, but yeah, those are, those are the best places. So um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that too, Matt. Like, look, the fact that you're saying this, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart and the top of my spirit, the fact that someone as accomplished as you are and as dedicated as you are saying that about me is truly humbling. And I thank you. And, and it does make me want to do more for what's going on around me. So thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. I only say that from the truth of my heart. So I appreciate everything you do, Omar. And um, thanks everyone for watching this episode of Mastermind Discussions. Uh, Till next time.